Hey guys, it's a beautiful day out here in Dallas, Texas. It is a little chilly, a little windy, but it's a good day because I'm narc free. A lot of you need to get narc free, and I would encourage you. Some of you just, it's its just, you don't think you can do it. You don't, you don't think that, you think that's, boy, if you give up this, then there's nothing else out there. And, I mean, there's fears, right? There's, there are fears. I, I understand that. However, they are fears, false evidence appearing real. That's an acronym that I learned a long time ago that I, I really understand that nowadays. You know, trying to pull the band-aid off really slowly when you know it needs to come off. Like, you know, if you're here, you know there's something wrong with your narc, right? You know that there's something... They, well, here's the most important thing. You know that staying with them is going to damage you further in the future. And, it, and they do. Um, I know people that have been checked into hospitals, mental hospitals. There's people that have been checked into regular hospitals uh, for injury. So there's all kinds of things that can come out of um, staying with these people. It's like how much longer... Do you want the pain to be there? How much longer can you stand this? And I, I would say a lot of you really don't know. Or you think that it's going to get better. That's even worse. And I get that. I mean, a lot of us, a lot of us have, a lot of us go through that. But they, these people don't get better. They get worse. And they don't change. Like, they never change how they can, they never develop empathy which means they care about you and they look at your situation. Hopefully this isn't too windy. So, but they never develop that. And so, being around somebody like that for a long period of time is just going to damage you because they're gonna impose their map of the world onto you. And it's gonna make you feel like you're worth less, worth less and worthless. So, looks like we're having some technical issues today on Facebook. I apologize for that. I don't know what's going on. So, the video I made earlier had some technical difficulties. Then, I made another video, but I made it on my personal page by accident. And then I got arrested at the mall. Well, I didn't get arrested, but I got told to not use my phone in the mall filming. <clears throat> so anyways, we'll try another Facebook video again. There seems to be some issues with how it's sending people out. But if I get some questions in here, I'm sh of course I want to answer them because I promised I would answer. And I will go back once this video is off, post your comments or anything below. And myself and other people will try and answer them for you. But you know, you've always got this group here, the Narcissist Support Group. You can go back. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and from that before. And there's people from all over the world willing to help you on this Facebook group. So I'd encourage you to do that. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Katie. So I was inside earlier, guys, and I was using examples in the mall, and I was filming stores. I was going up to a store and saying, okay, this store is the love store, and this store is the shoe store, and that represents this. And the security guard there asked me to stop. She was very polite about it, but she asked me to stop doing that. So, anyways, we had a good laugh. I can't do that anymore, so. Um, so I want to... Good morning, Trisha. So look, right for me, two and a half years ago, I got discarded. Almost two and a half years ago. I thought I was going to die. I, mean, I was actually relieved a little bit because when the narc discarded me, I kind of knew she was on a new supply, but I didn't know for sure if she would never admit anything. And it was a very confusing time in my life. But Oh, guys, but now, after being away, uh, no contact. Well, limited contact. We have kids together. But basically making a point to, if it doesn't have to be answered, don't answer it. 
if I get a text message that's about the kids, I answer it. If I get a text message that's about how, and this is like last year even, this hasn't happened lately at all, but if I get a text message about how inconsiderate I am and how selfish I am and always this or that, there's no need to answer it. And again, this is if you have kids. It is cold out today, so I'm in here. It's a little bit easier to hear me now. Um, good morning, Daryl. Good morning, Judy. Why do you still miss him? Well, chances are you have what's called a trauma bond. And if you Google that and look up videos about it, there's videos that explain how to kind of break that bond. A trauma bond is where you're in a, a situation or a relationship with somebody where they're constantly taking you to high highs and low lows. And with a narcissist, unfortunately, that creates an addiction and almost like an attraction to where we get used to that and we like that. I mean, we kind of like crave that. And uh, so what you do is you miss the highs. You miss the... Um, and what happens over time, if you don't kind of position it right in your head, um, you will think more about the highs and you'll think, oh, I miss him because of the highs. But in reality, you had lots of lows. You probably had more lows than highs. That's why you left. But if you don't like position it right, if you, and there's no right or wrong way. I'm just saying if you, there's a healthy way to think, you know, there's a way to, to make, um, to make a list in your head of, um, of uh, make a list not in your head, but uh, but on paper. If you make a list of all the wrongs that they've done to you, it's easier to go no contact. It's easier to stay the course. It's easier to remember why you left that person in the first place, why they're no longer in your life and you don't want them in your life. But what happens over time is we kind of, if we don't have that list, if we don't have that checklist or that list of everything that was that was wrong about them, the why, the, what was bad about them, then we tend to you know, we're positive people, right? We tend to think about all the good things, especially when we're lonely, when we haven't replaced them, which we don't want to replace them soon. You want to take time and get to figure out why you were attracted to them in the first place and make sure it doesn't happen again, that you don't attract another person in like that. So that's just very common. Tracy says, I made this list. Awesome. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, when we rely on our minds for the list, our minds are constantly changing. We're, we're constantly, uh, you know, reframing things. They do it really well. The narcissist does. They, they've got their delusions. They paint a picture of something and it becomes their truth. Um, we kind of do the same thing, but on a, for a different reason. We, you know, and I mean, all humans do it. We, um, so we don't have cognitive dissonance so that we see something that is happening to us in reality we paint a picture of it in our head to account for it to explain it and if something's not going the way that it should be then unfortunately a lot of us have uh, dysfunctional um, assignments to what what is happening to us so we because of our childhood we we uh, we go into these modes, these, and the narcissist knows these better than we do. They, they know how to get us to, um, to act in fear when we don't even know what's being going, what's going on with us. That's why we're easily manipulated because we were, we had that, the narcissist, they didn't really grow up with empathy. So they don't, they have a lot of room for other things in their life to explore and figure out. And because of their hurt and their pain, they, um, they kind of, uh, they develop a really good sense. Since there is no from within, they can't really see the empathy from within. They can't really do that. They develop a really good sense of being able to read people, being able to see when people are upset, when people are happy. And so the narcissist still fulfill themselves since they can't uh, process these emotions themselves. They process them through other people. That's kind of like how, that's kind of how it works. So, um, so if, for an example, if I'm a narcissist and I can make you cry, um, I can see you in pain. And so instead of me having to deal with a pain that I have, I manipulate you. I have control over you. So you start to cry in pain. And so in my mind as a narcissist, I am relieved of that um, pain because I was able to control it through you and you had the pain. And now I feel good and I feel like I'm better than you because you're the weak one. You're the emotional one. And I'm 
I didn't have any emotions that came out on the surface. So Bobby says so true about right highs and lows. I recognize this immediately once his infidelity came forward. This was a low and I broke, broke it off. Awesome. Uh, as more of his infidelities came forward, it was a constant low. He tried to bring me back by showing interest, but I refused to be a supply. He went no contact. That's good. Yeah. Cause so what they do is they try to make themselves really desirable by, by basically saying, Hey, look, all these other girls want me. They've been with me. So you want me too. And they can do that to a certain degree. But what happens is when you go no contact with them, you break the feedback mechanism that they get. They don't, they don't, um, they don't know what you're thinking. If they're around you all the time or for periods of time and they go no contact and they go right back in where they left off, that's their ideal situation for them because then they know what you're thinking. They know how to manipulate you and, uh, it works to their advantage. Is it, uh, Kimberly asks, is it normal to be the one constantly trying to make contact after discard? I would panic and obsessively try and talk to him. He's never done this, done the same, even when I was the one to discard. Um, is it normal to be the one constantly trying to make contact? Uh, I would say more often than not, what I've seen is when people recognize that they're with a narcissist, they, um, they end up getting hoovered. They end up getting, um, uh, the narcissist tries to reel them back into the situation, the abuse cycle, and they do it through being sweet. They, you know, they, you know, you, the narcissist breaks up, you break up with a narcissist or they break up with you, they discard you. Right. And then the narcissist, when they discard, they want to leave you hanging. They want to leave you pining after them. They want to leave you like, like wounded because they're wounded creatures themselves. So they want to leave you with this incredible yearning for them. Um, like a, almost like a, how dare you? How dare he do that to me? I've got to find out why he did that to me. That's what they want to leave you at. They want to leave it to where they have, they were in control all along. They have power over you. Um, you'll always want them. That's where they want to leave you. Um, and I mean, they're, that's how they want to leave you. So it's natural for you to want to reach out to them and contact you them, contact them so that you can reach out to them. And then when you do call them or message them, they don't message you back. They're like, ah, I don't need this gal. They, uh, it's almost like they predict that when you don't message them back, when you go no contact with them, they're a little bit more panicked. They're like, huh, she hasn't reached out to me. What's going on? I wonder if she's got a new guy or wonder, you know, then they're nice to you. Then they hoover you again. This is after discard Then they hoover you. They, Hey, how's it going? Haven't seen you in a while. You know, they're all nice and you think, oh, maybe they, maybe they are a good guy after all then. So I think there's, I don't know if it's normal, but I think there's a lot of both sides that are trying to get back into a comfort zone. The narcissist wants to keep the abuse cycle going, um, as long as, uh, the supply is there. Now, if you've learned something, you've got a new boyfriend or something, or, you're, you've changed quite a bit. The narcissist will go to new and easier supply. Um, Katie says, wow, that makes so much sense. Both my ex and my mother are narcs and I never understood why they always did everything to make me cry. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. They, uh, narcissists want to get a reaction out of you. Basically it's, um, the worst thing for a narcissist is indifference or no contact. Uh, and, uh, another thing that they don't like is, uh, boredom. They, if things are really boring, they don't have any supply to garner, you know? So they got to make e things either be really, really high and the narcissist, they get all the attention like, Oh, I can't believe you did this. This is so great. You're all, you're the most, you're the best guy in the world. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But what's easier for them and what's quicker and faster and what's more prevalent, especially later on in relationships is they will use the negative things to really get you upset. Those you they can get a reaction a lot faster out of you. Um, uh, they can just start calling you fat. They can, you know, uh, talk about how you always do this or you always do that. And remember guys, they're just getting a reaction. So when they say stuff to you, 
almost always, and they've learned this, there'll be a little bit of truth to it, right? A little bit of truth, and then they'll pour a lie on that, and then they'll magnify it. They're really good at doing that. They're really good at taking... They're really good at taking the... Um, a small minor thing, like... Um, like for an example here. Okay, this parking lot. I'm walking along, and there's blue gum. Okay, there's gum on the parking lot. Now, that's just a minor insignificant thing. Okay, there's blue gum out in the parking lot. What if I go into mall to the mall and I go, and I'm a narc, right? That's why I make a big deal out of everything. I go, hey, um, I noticed there was gum out in the parking lot, so I wanted to bring it to your attention because... You know, there's lawsuits that happen in malls, and I know that you're the owner of the mall, or you represent the owner of the mall. Uh, he needs to give me a call because there's a lot of crazy things that happen with gum in parking lots. I know it sounds silly, but, you know, people like people have been known to step on the gum, and it, and it makes them fall. It creates a trip. It's like a slip and fall accident, and that's classified under uh, 151 of the title of this, under this state law, you know. Smith versus Jones, and Jones was the mall owner. So I, I, th I think you really need to pay attention. Now, notice how there's an element of truth. There is gum on the parking lot of the mall. But what the narc does is they take the little gum and then they blow it up into this big thing for their own self-interest, for their own supply. That's what they're doing to you. Not with gum, obviously, but with other things. And they're storing these. So what a narc does is he'll walk around the parking lot. Oh, there's gum there. Okay, I'm going to store that. I'm going to use that for later. Uh, oh, there's a crack over here. So I'm going to use that for later. There's another potential supply mechanism that they can use to, you know, get the mall owner's attention. The mall owner's the person they're trying to date, the person they've been dating. They want to have more up. They want to have one up on the mall owner. So... Uh, Lisa says, they will hoover you with a random appearing text. Yeah, it's a very carefully worded, carefully crafted text, though, I guarantee you. Um, Martha says, is it common for a narcissist to go on you as a supercharged form of silent treatment? Oh yeah, they love silent treatment. I tried to leave eight times and he hoovered me back. And the last time he brutally discarded me, insinuated I should grovel or he was going no contact. Also in order for them to accuse you of being abusive. Yeah, the, they're always the victims, right? They, <laughs> they, they, they really do believe they're the victims too. I mean, they, look, they've been doing this since they were like five and six-year-olds. And at one point, they were kind of the victims. They were like abused by their parents or there was a traumatic event, which they, their little brains couldn't handle. We're all little at that point, right? Our little emotional, emotionally developed minds. And so they do feel like they're the victims. But... The difference with them is that they will use the they will use everything in their power to feel powerful. So they will just flip that victim mentality and make it into an area where they can dominate. They will use it to dominate. You and I don't do that. We're you know, we're victims and we're truly victims. However, in their minds they become the victim when they when it's convenient for them, when they can get their power back. I know it's hard to understand, but there really is something to that. I mean, I've researched it a little bit. Martha says, or I'm sorry, Denise says, he always says he wanted me to finally let him go. When I try, he contacts me sometimes very obsessively. Yeah, he's, they're very contradictory. Um, they're like a walking contradiction. They're, they're, they're telling you one thing, like, leave me alone. And then they're like calling you. So that's the little kid in them that's their mentality um, then when I choose to call back as soon as we fight he will again say I should just leave him and stop contacting him you know if you do that it's gonna mess up his world because he needs you to come back after him he's it's that old salesman that you know um, the salesman goes into the, the prospects office presents the prospect something and before the salesman, the salesman said, well, if this deal's going to go. I'm just going to leave. And when the salesman gets up, he leaves and he puts his hand on the door. And there's a sales technique where he puts his hand on the door knob like he's going to open it. But he says, you know, Mr. Prospect, what if I could get you this price? 
And that's the whole thing with them is they're, you think like, like if you're able to see a lot of us, they have us so confused. They have us in this whirlwind where they're constantly going, look here, look here, look here, look here. And we're constantly doing this, we're off balance. And what happens is we're not able to just kind of sit back. I'm going to, I'm going to move my seat back. You hear that? I'm moving my seat back and just chill. We're not able to just sit back and chill and go, okay, what just happened here? He just told me this and he told me that over here yesterday. See, a lot of us just have to step back and detach. It's called detachment. And so when you detach, when you're in a relaxed, um, kind of a learning, kind of an easy state of mind, you can learn and you can see the situation better. That's why other people around you can see it better than you, especially healthy people. You tell them, you're almost embarrassed to tell them, and they just say, well, get out of that relationship. Don't call that guy back. And you're like, well, I know I can't do that. And then, and then the healthy person's like, well, <laughs> I, I gave you my advice, you know, because they can see it because they're, because they're relaxed and they're detached. They're detached from it, relaxed and detached. <laughs> I am right now relaxed and detached. I can see every text message my ex narc sends me. I can see through it. It's it's there's 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 sometimes there's no, no substance there. There's there's abuse, and I, so I can see that with her now. So I'm gonna start driving and talking. Is this bad? Okay, I'm not gonna read your things right now, but I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna read one and then I'm gonna talk about it because I don't wanna. Uh, hey Josh, my counselor said I should stop watching narc videos and narc support groups because I'm going to live with fantasy beliefs. Huh. Uh, concentrate on myself with my sex love addiction. Well, if your counselor says that, then um, that might be good. I mean, I I don't know your situation, so if you got a professional, I would listen, definitely listen to a professional's advice. I'm just sharing my experience. I'm not. I'm not telling anybody directly out there, if you notice, I'm not saying do this or do that. I'm just sharing my experience and what I've learned. Uh, obviously, I'm not a counselor. I've got a minor in psychology, and that's about it. And I've read lots of books and gone through narc abuse. <laughs> How can I share this? Uh, you can share it within the group. I don't, well, actually, I don't think there is a share button because things in the group we've set up where this group is uh, remains private for people so that people aren't exposing other people um, especially nargs and things like that so it's kind of a closed group so you really can't share it outside the group um, I may eventually make these available on YouTube but I have to edit out people's names and everything because I do respect people's privacy and I've checked with the group too okay Barbara says mine was mere death when we connected and now I have been there for him for him for them Yeah, they sacrifice your personal life. Yeah, they, they don't... See, they feel entitled. They, they don't feel like... Like you and I have this sense of balance, this fairness, right? We see the scales and things, you know? When, you know, somebody gives us attention, we give them attention. Somebody takes care of us, we want to take care of them. And a lot of times, we're the people that make the first move. We're the people that give people the benefit of the doubt. So we'll be, we'll be very nice in, in that. But the narcs don't play that way. In fact, they take advantage of that now they'll future fake us and they'll pretend that they're going to be this reciprocal type of person healthy person that that we think they are but it's but it's only it's only because they learned see that they didn't learn like they didn't learn um, how a car operates they just learn how to drive the car and they learn how to get you in the car and drive you in the car with them but they can tell you, oh, I know how this car works, and I built these cars before, and I used to, I know how this works and that works. Because they'll, they'll pick up a few lines, they'll, they'll watch other people who have built cars and learn a little bit about it. But then you think, they know all about this car, they're marvelous, they, they know the whole ins and outs, but they don't. They're, they're faking it. It, it. It's an illusion. And what they're faking is not just about cars, what they're faking is, is empathy, and it's, it's that they care about you. And they can be really good at it. They can be really convincing at it. And you think, how could they have lied like that? How could they do this? Well, that's all they've got. That's their defense mechanism. That's the, that's what keeps them alive. That's like, 
abandoning an ark is like terrifying to them now you think you'd think that they wouldn't be like that oh well they no they'll be fine they're very tough they're confident no that is like at, at a very core level abandonment is like their worst fear and they cover it up with all kinds of confidence and, and act like they don't care if an ark's pretending like they don't care they really do care they're just like i mean i had something happen to me recently i had a uh, something where i was with the ex narc and um and she was listening to the conversations because it was for a function for my daughter and uh and i was talking to somebody else and she was listening in but she acted like she didn't care wasn't listening in and i turned around to her the ex narc to say something uh, about the kids like hey what about this and that and she's like oh what huh what like she acted like she 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 uh, oh 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 i wasn't listening oh what huh <laughs> i mean it's just so it was so obvious now but hey, look i don't know if my narc was an ex narc i'm gonna be honest with you guys she was never diagnosed with that most of them 90 percent of them never get diagnosed so you never really know so but they just have problematic behaviors. They probably are or have some continuum of it. They're on the continuum, which is like a sliding scale of best to worst. Uh, so that's all you gotta know is that, how does that person make you feel? Are they treating you with respect? Are they giving to you? Are you in a relationship with a giver or are you in a relationship with a taker? A lot of us think, well, this is it. This is the only person I got left. There's six, Point five billion people in the world and there's a lot of healthy people out there there's more healthy people I say there's more there's more non nox non narcissists out there than there are narcissists now whether they're all healthy you know uh, most people have some something about them that isn't right but anyways I hate to do this guys but I got I got another appointment so I'm gonna um, I'm going to end this video. I'm going to say, leave your comments below. I'll read them. I'll get to them. Um, uh, other people will get to them as well. So feel free to answer things in the, in the, uh, things for discussion here. If you want to talk about what we just talked about in here, sorry, this video is so short. Um, I had some incident at the mall where, um, they wouldn't let me film things and I was filming like stores and doing different things, trying to make analogies and illustrate points. Um, but they didn't like that. So, uh, security guard, she was very polite, but very, you know, <laughs> determined to say, you know, you shouldn't do that. So, anyways, uh, Lisa says, can you give some examples of how they triangulate, or sorry, why they manipulate you while no contact? Well, that's called manipulation by proxy. And so what they do is they use uh, people, different people, like children as proxy. So they, they have a script idea in their head. They have this play, how they want it to play out, you know. And so they get the kids kind of in on it. They know this is probably going to affect you. And look, if they never get feedback from you, if you don't react to it, they don't keep trying to do that. They do it, it fails, do it, it fails. And when you go no contact, it's complete failure on their part. They're not getting any feedback whatsoever. So go no contact. Best thing you can do, go gray rock if you can't go no contact. And there's lots of videos about gray rocking. There's one, in fact, I left on my page that has a different side of gray rocking, very good video, because it sounds easier than what it is. It's, it's kind of difficult. I mean, it sounds easy, but um, become as exciting as a gray rock. So if you look up gray rock narcissist on Google, you'll find a bunch of articles and stuff on it if you have kids. If you don't have kids, go no contact. Get them out of your life. You're better off. You don't have anything tying you down. Make a fresh start, make a clean start. You'll be so much happier. So, okay. Anyways, guys, I'm actually going to meet some of the people from the narcissist group. We're meeting live today and I'm about to drive in and meet with them. So I don't think they want to be on camera. So I'm not going to do this to them, put them on Facebook live, but otherwise I would continue on with this and we would have a live, uh, physically live discussion. All right. So anyways, love you guys. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.